Fundamentals of Nursing 1 Question 1. The most appropriate nursing order for a patient who develops dyspnea and shortness of breath would be A. Maintain the patient on strict bed rest at all times. B. Maintain the patient in an orthopneic position as needed. C. Administer oxygen by venturi mask at 24%, as needed. D. Allow a one-hour rest period between activities. Answer, B. When a patient develops dyspnea and shortness of breath, the orthopneic position encourages maximum chest expansion and keeps the abdominal organs from pressing against the diaphragm, thus improving ventilation. Bed rest and oxygen by venturi mask at 24% would improve oxygenation of the tissues and cells but must be ordered by a physician. Allowing for rest periods decreases the possibility of hypoxia. Question 2 the nurse observes that Mr. Adams begins to have increased difficulty breathing. She elevates the head of the bed to the high fowler position, which decreases his respiratory distress. The nurse documents this breathing as A. Tachypnea B. Upnka C. Orthopnea D. Hyperventilation Answer, C. Orthopnea is difficulty of breathing except in the upright position. Tachypnea is rapid respiration characterized by quick, shallow breaths. Upnea is normal respiration, quiet, rhythmic, and without effort. Question 3. The physician orders a platelet count to be performed on Mrs. Smith after breakfast. The nurse is responsible for A. Instructing the patient about this diagnostic test. B. Writing the order for this test. C. Giving the patient breakfast. D. All of the above. Answer. C. A platelet count evaluates the number of platelets in the circulating blood volume. The nurse is responsible for giving the patient breakfast at the scheduled time. The physician is responsible for instructing the patient about the test and for writing the order for the test. Question 4. Mrs. Mitchell has been given a copy of her diet. The nurse discusses the foods allowed on a 500 mg low-sodium diet. These include A. A ham and Swiss cheese sandwich on whole wheat bread. B. Mashed potatoes and broiled chicken. C. A tossed salad with oil and vinegar and olives. D. Chicken bouillon. Answer. B. Mashed potatoes and broiled chicken are low in natural sodium chloride. Ham, olives and chicken bouillon contain large amounts of sodium and are contraindicated on a low-sodium diet. Question 5. The physician orders a maintenance dose of 5,000 units of subcutaneous heparin and anticoagulant daily. Nursing responsibilities for Mrs. Mitchell now include A. Reviewing daily activated partial thromboplastin time APTT and prothrombin time. B. Reporting an APTT above 45 seconds to the physician. C. Assessing the patient for signs and symptoms of frank and occult bleeding. D. All of the above. Answer. D. All of the identified nursing responsibilities are pertinent when a patient is receiving heparin. The normal activated partial thromboplastin time is 16 to 25 seconds and the normal prothrombin time is 12 to 15 seconds.
these levels must remain within 2 to 2 and 1 half the normal levels. Our patients receiving anticoagulant therapy must be observed for signs and symptoms of frank and occult bleeding including hemorrhage, hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea, restlessness, pallor, cold and clammy skin, thirst and confusion. Blood pressure should be measured every 4 hours and the patient should be instructed to report promptly any bleeding that occurs with tooth brushing, bowel movements, urination or heavy prolonged menstruation. Question 6. The four main concepts common to nursing that appear in each of the current conceptual models are A. Person, nursing, environment, medicine. B. Person health, nursing, support systems. C. Person, health, psychology, nursing. D. Person, environment, health, nursing. Answer, D. The focus concepts that have been accepted by all theorists as the focus of nursing practice from the time of Florence Nightingale include the person receiving nursing care, his environment, his health on the health illness continuum, and the nursing actions necessary to meet his needs. Question 7. In Maslow's hierarchy of physiologic needs, the human need of greatest priority is A. Love B. Elimination. C. Nutrition. D. Oxygen. Answer, D. Maslow, who defined a need as a satisfaction whose absence causes illness, considered oxygen to be the most important physiologic need, without it, human life could not exist. According to this theory, other physiologic needs including food, water, elimination, shelter, rest and sleep, activity and temperature regulation must be met before proceeding to the next hierarchical levels on psychosocial needs. Question 8. The family of an accident victim who has been declared brain dead seems amenable to organ donation. What should the nurse do? A. Discourage them from making a decision until their grief has eased. B. Listen to their concerns and answer their questions honestly. C. Encourage them to sign the consent form right away. D. Tell them the body will not be available for a wake or funeral. Answer, B. The brain-dead patient's family needs support and reassurance in making a decision about organ donation. Because transplants are done within hours of death, decisions about organ donation must be made as soon as possible. However, the family's concerns must be addressed before members are asked to sign a consent form. The body of an organ donor is available for burial. Question 9 a new head nurse on a unit is distressed about the poor staffing on the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. What should she do? A. Complain to her fellow nurses. B. Wait until she knows more about the unit. C. Discuss the problem with her supervisor. D. Inform the staff that they must volunteer to rotate. Answer, C. Although a new head nurse should initially spend time observing the unit for its strengths and weakness, she should take action if a problem threatens patient safety. In this case, the supervisor is the resource person to approach. Question 10. Which of the following principles of primary nursing has proven the most satisfying to the patient and nurse? A. Continuity of patient care promotes efficient cost-effective nursing care. b. Autonomy and authority for planning are best delegated to a nurse who knows the patient well. c. 
Accountability is clearest when one nurse is responsible for the overall plan and its implementation. D. The holistic approach provides for a therapeutic relationship, continuity, and efficient nursing care. Answer, D. Studies have shown that patients and nurses both respond well to primary nursing care units. Patients feel less anxious and isolated and more secure because they are allowed to participate in planning their own care. Nurses feel personal satisfaction, much of it related to positive feedback from the patients. They also seem to gain a greater sense of achievement and esprit de corps. Question 11 if nurse administers an injection to a patient who refuses that injection, she has committed a assault and battery b negligence c malpractice d none of the above answer a Assault is the unjustifiable attempt or threat to touch or injure another person. Battery is the unlawful touching of another person or the carrying out of threatened physical harm. Thus, any act that a nurse performs on the patient against his will is considered assault and battery. Question 12. If patient asks the nurse her opinion about a particular physician's and the nurse replies that the physician is incompetent. The nurse could be held liable for a slander, b libel, c assault, d respondent superior. Answer a oral communication that injures an individual's reputation is considered slander. Written communication that does the same is considered libel. Question 13. A registered nurse reaches to answer the telephone on a busy pediatric unit, momentarily turning away from a three-month-old infant she has been weighing. The infant falls off the scale, suffering a skull fracture. The nurse could be charged with A. Defamation B. Assault C. Battery. D. Malpractice. Answer. D. Malpractice is defined as injurious or unprofessional actions that harm another. It involves professional misconduct, such as omission or commission of an act that a reasonable and prudent nurse would or would not do. In this example, the standard of care was breached, a three-month-old infant should never be left unattended on a scale. Question 14. Which of the following is an example of nursing malpractice? A. The nurse administers penicillin to a patient with a documented history of allergy to the drug. The patient experiences an allergic reaction and has cerebral damage resulting from anexia. B. The nurse supplies a hot water bottle or a heating pad to the abdomen of a patient with abdominal cramping. C. The nurse assists a patient out of bed with the bed locked in position, the patient slips and fractures his right humerus. D. The nurse administers the wrong medication to a patient and the patient vomits. This information is documented and reported to the physician and the nursing supervisor. Answer, A. The three elements necessary to establish a nursing malpractice are nursing error administering penicillin to a patient with a documented allergy to the drug, injury cerebral damage, and proximal cause administering the penicillin caused the cerebral damage. Applying a hot water bottle or heating pad to a patient without a physician's order does not include the three required components. Assisting a patient out of bed with the bed locked in position is the correct nursing practice, therefore, the fracture was not the result of malpractice. Administering an incorrect medication is a nursing error, 
However, if such action resulted in a serious illness or chronic problem, the nurse could be sued for malpractice. Question 15. Which of the following signs and symptoms would the nurse expect to find when assessing an Asian patient for postoperative pain following abdominal surgery? A. Decreased blood pressure and heart rate and shallow respirations. B. Quiet crying. C. Immobility, diaphoresis, and avoidance of deep breathing or coughing. D. Changing position every two hours. Answer, C. An Asian patient is likely to hide his pain. Consequently, the nurse must observe four objective signs. In an abdominal surgery patient, these might include immobility, diaphoresis, and avoidance of deep breathing or coughing, as well as increased heart rate, shallow respirations stemming from pain upon moving the diaphragm and respiratory muscles, and guarding or rigidity of the abdominal wall. Such a patient is unlikely to display emotion, such as crying. Question 16. A patient is admitted to the hospital with complaints of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and severe abdominal pain. Which of the following would immediately alert the nurse that the patient has bleeding from the GI tract? A. Complete blood count. B. Guayac test. C. Vital signs. D. Abdominal girth. Answer, B. To assess for GI tract bleeding when frank blood is absent, the nurse has two options, she can test for occult blood in vomitus, if present, or in stool, through guayac hemocult test. A complete blood count does not provide immediate results and does not always immediately reflect blood loss. Changes in vital signs may be caused by factors other than blood loss. Abdominal girth is unrelated to blood loss. Question 17. The correct sequence for assessing the abdomen is A. Tympanic percussion, measurement of abdominal girth, and inspection. B. Assessment for distension, tenderness, and discoloration around the umbilicus. C. Percussions, palpation, and auscultation. D. Auscultation, percussion, and palpation. Answer, D. Because percussion and palpation can affect bowel motility and thus bowel sounds, they should follow auscultation in abdominal assessment. Tympanic percussion, measurement of abdominal girth, and inspection are methods of assessing the abdomen. Assessing for distension, tenderness and discoloration around the umbilicus can indicate various bowel-related conditions, such as cholecystitis, appendicitis and peritonitis. Question 18. High-pitched gurgles head over the right lower quadrant are A. A sign of increased bowel motility B. A sign of decreased bowel motility C. Normal bowel sounds D. A sign of abdominal cramping Answer, C. Hyperactive sounds indicate increased bowel motility, two or three sounds per minute indicate decreased bowel motility. Abdominal cramping with hyperactive, high-pitched tinkling bowel sounds can indicate a bowel obstruction. Question 19, a patient about to undergo abdominal inspection is best placed in which of the following positions? A. Prone. B. Trendelenburg. C. Supine. D. Side lying. Answer, C. The supine position also called the dorsal position, 
in which the patient lies on his back with his face upward, allows for easy access to the abdomen. In the prone position, the patient lies on his abdomen with his face turned to the side. In the Trendelenburg position, the head of the bed is tilted downward to 30 to 40 degrees so that the upper body is lower than the legs. In the lateral position, the patient lies on his side. Question 20. For a rectal examination, the patient can be directed to assume which of the following positions? A. Genupectoral B. Sims C. Horizontal recumbent D. All of the above Answer, D. All of these positions are appropriate for a rectal examination. In the genupectoral knee chest position, the patient kneels and rests his chest on the table, forming a 90-degree angle between the torso and upper legs. In Sims position, the patient lies on his left side with the left arm behind the body and his right leg flexed. In the horizontal recumbent position, the patient lies on his back with legs extended and hips rotated outward. Question 21. During a Romberg test, the nurse asks the patient to assume which position? A. Sitting. B. Standing. C. Genupectoral. D. Trendelenburg. Answer. B. During a Romberg test which evaluates for sensory or cerebellar ataxia, the patient must stand with feet together and arms resting at the sides, first with eyes open, then with eyes closed. The need to move the feet apart to maintain this stance is an abnormal finding. Question 22. If a patient's blood pressure is 150-96, his pulse pressure is A. 54 B. 96. C. 150. D. 246. Answer. A. The pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and diastolic blood pressure readings, in this case, 54. Question 23. A patient is kept off food and fluids for 10 hours before surgery. His oral temperature at 8 a.m. is 99.8 F 37.7 C. This temperature reading probably indicates A. Infection B. Hypothermia C. Anxiety D. Dehydration Answer, D. A slightly elevated temperature in the immediate preoperative or postoperative period may result from the lack of fluids before surgery rather than from infection. Anxiety will not cause an elevated temperature. Hypothermia is an abnormally low body temperature. Question 24. Which of the following parameters should be checked when assessing respirations? A. Rate. B. Rhythm. C. Symmetry. D. All of the above. Answer. D. The quality and efficiency of the respiratory process can be determined by appraising the rate, rhythm, depth, ease, sound, and symmetry of respirations. Question 25. A 38-year-old patient's vital signs at 8 a.m. are axillary temperature 99.6 F 37.6 C, pulse rate, 88, respiratory rate, 30. Which findings should be reported? A. Respiratory rate only. B. Temperature only. C. Pulse rate and temperature. D. Temperature and respiratory rate.
Answer. D. Question 26. All of the following can cause tachycardia except A. Fever B. Exercise C. Sympathetic nervous system stimulation D. Parasympathetic nervous system stimulation Answer. D. Parasympathetic nervous system stimulation of the heart decreases the heart rate as well as the force of contraction, rate of impulse conduction and blood flow through the coronary vessels. Fever, exercise, and sympathetic stimulation all increase the heart rate. Question 27. Palpating the midclavicular line is the correct technique for assessing. A. Baseline vital signs. B. Systolic blood pressure. C. Respiratory rate. D. Apical pulse. Answer. D. The apical pulse. The pulse at the apex of the heart is located on the midclavicular line at the fourth, fifth, or sixth intercostal space. Baseline vital signs include pulse rate, temperature, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. Blood pressure is typically assessed at the antecubital fossa, and respiratory rate is assessed best by observing chest movement with each inspiration and expiration. Question 28. The absence of which pulse may not be a significant finding when a patient is admitted to the hospital? A. Apical. B. Radial. C. Pedal. D. Femoral. Answer. C. Because the pedal pulse cannot be detected in 10% to 20% of the population, its absence is not necessarily a significant finding. However, the presence or absence of the pedal pulse should be documented upon admission so that changes can be identified during the hospital stay. Absence of the apical, radial, or femoral pulse is abnormal and should be investigated. Question 29. Which of the following patients is at greatest risk for developing pressure ulcers? A. An alert, chronic arthritic patient treated with steroids and aspirin. B. An 88-year-old incontinent patient with gastric cancer who is confined to his bed at home. C. An apathetic 63-year-old copped patient receiving nasal oxygen via cannula. D. A confused 78-year-old patient with congestive heart failure CHF who requires assistance to get out of bed. Answer, B. Pressure ulcers are most likely to develop in patients with impaired mental status, mobility, activity level, nutrition, circulation and bladder or bowel control. Age is also a factor. Thus, the 88-year-old incontinent patient who has impaired nutrition from gastric cancer and is confined to bed is at greater risk. Question 30. The physician orders the administration of high humidity oxygen by face mask and placement of the patient in a high Fowler's position. After assessing Mrs. Paul, the nurse writes the following nursing diagnosis, impaired gas exchange related to increased secretions. Which of the following nursing interventions has the greatest potential for improving this situation? A. Encourage the patient to increase her fluid intake to 200 milliliters every two hours. B. Place a humidifier in the patient's room. C. Continue administering oxygen by high humidity face mask. D. Perform chest physiotherapy on a regular schedule. Answer. A. 
adequate hydration thins and loosens pulmonary secretions and also helps to replace fluids lost from elevated temperature, diaphoresis, dehydration and dyspnea. High humidity air and chest physiotherapy help liquefy and mobilize secretions. Question 31. The most common deficiency seen in alcoholics is A. Thiamine B. Riboflavin C. Pyridoxine D. Pantothenic acid Answer, A. Chronic alcoholism commonly results in thiamine deficiency and other symptoms of malnutrition. Question 32, which of the following statement is incorrect about a patient with dysphagia? A. The patient will find pureed or soft foods, such as custards, easier to swallow than water. B. Fowler's or semi-Fowler's position reduces the risk of aspiration during swallowing. C. The patient should always feed himself. D. The nurse should perform oral hygiene before assisting with feeding. Answer, C. A patient with dysphagia difficulty swallowing requires assistance with feeding. Feeding himself is a long-range expected outcome. Soft foods, Fowler's or semi-Fowler's position, and oral hygiene before eating should be part of the feeding regimen. Question 33. To assess the kidney function of a patient with an indwelling urinary Foley catheter, the nurse measures his hourly urine output. She should notify the physician if the urine output is A. Less than 30 milliliters slash hour B. 64 milliliters in 2 hours C. 90 milliliters in 3 hours D. 125 milliliters in 4 hours Answer a. A urine output of less than 30 milliliters slash hour indicates hypovolemia or oliguria, which is related to kidney function and inadequate fluid intake. Question 34. Certain substances increase the amount of urine produced. These include A. Caffeine-containing drinks, such as coffee and cola. B. Beets. C. Urinary analgesics. D. Kaline with pectin kaopectate. Answer. A. Fluids containing caffeine have a diuretic effect. Beets and urinary analgesics, such as pyridium, can color urine red. Kaopectate is an antidiarrheal medication. Question 35. A male patient who had surgery two days ago for head and neck cancer is about to make his first attempt to ambulate outside his room. The nurse notes that he is steady on his feet and that his vision was unaffected by the surgery. Which of the following nursing interventions would be appropriate? A. Encourage the patient to walk in the hall alone. B. Discourage the patient from walking in the hall for a few more days. C. Accompany the patient for his walk. D. Consult a physical therapist before allowing the patient to ambulate. Answer, C. A hospitalized surgical patient leaving his room for the first time fears rejection and others staring at him, so he should not walk alone. Accompanying him will offer moral support, enabling him to face the rest of the world. Patients should begin ambulation as soon as possible after surgery to decrease complications and to regain strength and confidence. Waiting to consult a physical therapist is unnecessary. Question 36. A patient has exacerbation of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease copped manifested by shortness of breath, 
orthopnea, thick, tenacious secretions, and a dry hacking cough. An appropriate nursing diagnosis would be a ineffective airway clearance related to thick, tenacious secretions. b ineffective airway clearance related to dry, hacking cough. c ineffective individual coping to cough. d pain related to immobilization of affected leg. Answer, A. Thick, tenacious secretions, a dry, hacking cough, orthopnea, and shortness of breath are signs of ineffective airway clearance. Ineffective airway clearance related to dry, hacking cough is incorrect because the cough is not the reason for the ineffective airway clearance. Ineffective individual coping related to cough is wrong because the etiology for a nursing diagnosis should not be a medical diagnosis cough and because no data indicate that the patient is coping ineffectively. Pain related to immobilization of affected leg would be an appropriate nursing diagnosis for a patient with a leg fracture. Question 37, Mrs. Lim begins to cry as the nurse discusses hair loss. The best response would be A. Don't worry. It's only temporary. B. Why are you crying? I didn't get to the bad news yet. C. Your hair is really pretty. D. I know this will be difficult for you, but your hair will grow back after the completion of chemotherapy. Answer, D. I know this will be difficult acknowledges the problem and suggests a resolution to it. Don't worry. Offers some relief but doesn't recognize the patient's feelings. Dot dot I didn't get to the bad news yet would be inappropriate at any time. Your hair is really pretty offers no consolation or alternatives to the patient. Question 38. An additional vitamin C is required during all of the following periods except A. Infancy B. Young adulthood C. Childhood D. Pregnancy Answer, B. Additional vitamin C is needed in growth periods such as infancy and childhood, and during pregnancy to supply demands for fetal growth and maternal tissues. Other conditions requiring extra vitamin C include wound healing, fever, infection and stress. Question 39. A prescribed amount of oxygen is needed for a patient with COP to prevent A. Cardiac arrest related to increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood PACO2. B. Circulatory overload due to hypervolemia. C. Respiratory excitement. D. Inhibition of the respiratory hypoxic stimulus. Answer. D. Delivery of more than 2 liters of oxygen per minute to a patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease COPD, who is usually in a state of compensated respiratory acidosis retaining carbon dioxide CO2, can inhibit the hypoxic stimulus for respiration. An increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood PACO2 would not initially result in cardiac arrest. Circulatory overload and respiratory excitement have no relevance to the question. Question 40. After one week of hospitalization, Mr. Gray develops hypoglymia. Which of the following is the most significant symptom of his disorder? A. Lethargy. B. Increased pulse rate and blood pressure. C. Muscle weakness. D. Muscle irritability. Answer, C. 
presenting symptoms of hypoglymia serum potassium level below 3.5 mEq. Leader include muscle weakness, chronic fatigue, and cardiac dysrhythmias. The combined effects of inadequate food intake and prolonged diarrhea can deplete the potassium stores of a patient with GI problems. Question 41. Which of the following nursing interventions promotes patient safety? A. Asses the patient's ability to ambulate and transfer from a bed to a chair. B. Demonstrate the signal system to the patient. C. Check to see that the patient is wearing his identification band. D. All of the above. Answer, D. Assisting a patient with ambulation and transfer from a bed to a chair allows the nurse to evaluate the patient's ability to carry out these functions safely. Demonstrating the signal system and providing an opportunity for a return demonstration ensures that the patient knows how to operate the equipment and encourages him to call for assistance when needed. Checking the patient's identification band verifies the patient's identity and prevents identification mistakes in drug administration. Question 42. Studies have shown that about 40% of patients fall out of bed despite the use of side rails. This has led to which of the following conclusions? A. Side rails are ineffective. B. Side rails should not be used. C. Side rails are a deterrent that prevent a patient from falling out of bed. D. Side rails are a reminder to a patient not to get out of bed. Answer, D. Since about 40% of patients fall out of bed despite the use of side rails, side rails cannot be said to prevent falls. However, they do serve as a reminder that the patient should not get out of bed. The other answers are incorrect interpretations of the statistical data. Question 43. Examples of patients suffering from impaired awareness include all of the following except A. A semi-conscious or over-fatigued patient. B. A disoriented or confused patient. C. A patient who cannot care for himself at home. D. A patient demonstrating symptoms of drugs or alcohol withdrawal. Answer, C. A patient who cannot care for himself at home does not necessarily have impaired awareness, he may simply have some degree of immobility. Question 44. The most common injury among elderly persons is A. Atherosclerotic changes in the blood vessels. B. Increased incidence of gallbladder disease. C. Urinary tract infection. D. Hip fracture. Answer. D. Hip fracture, the most common injury among elderly persons, usually results from osteoporosis. The other answers are diseases that can occur in the elderly from physiologic changes. Question 45. The most common psychogenic disorder among elderly person is A. Depression B. Sleep disturbances such as bizarre dreams C. Inability to concentrate. D. Decreased appetite. Answer. A. Sleep disturbances, inability to concentrate and decreased appetite are symptoms of depression, the most common psychogenic disorder among elderly persons. Other symptoms include diminished memory, apathy disinterest in appearance, withdrawal, and irritability. Depression typically begins before the onset of old age and usually is caused by psychosocial, genetic, or biochemical factors. 
Question 46. Which of the following vascular system changes results from aging? A. Increased peripheral resistance of the blood vessels. B. Decreased blood flow. C. Increased workload of the left ventricle. D. All of the above. Answer, D. Aging decreases elasticity of the blood vessels, which leads to increased peripheral resistance and decreased blood flow. These changes, in turn, increase the workload of the left ventricle. Question 47. Which of the following is the most common cause of dementia among elderly persons? A. Parkinson's disease. B. Multiple sclerosis. C. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis Luger Higgs disease. D. Alzheimer's disease. Answer D. Alzheimer's semicolon S disease, sometimes known as senile dementia of the Alzheimer's type or primary degenerative dementia, is an insidious, progressive, irreversible, and degenerative disease of the brain whose etiology is still unknown. Parkinson's disease is a neurologic disorder caused by lesions in the extrapyramidal system and manifested by tremors, muscle rigidity, hypokinesis, dysphagia, and dysphonia. Multiple sclerosis, a progressive, degenerative disease involving demyelination of the nerve fibers, usually begins in young adulthood and is marked by periods of remission and exacerbation. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, a disease marked by progressive degeneration of the neurons, eventually results in atrophy of all the muscles, including those necessary for respiration. Question 48. The nurse's most important legal responsibility after a patient's death in a hospital is A. Obtaining a consent of an autopsy. B. Notifying the coroner or medical examiner. C. Labeling the corpse appropriately. D. Ensuring that the attending physician issues the death certification. Answer. C. The nurse is legally responsible for labeling the corpse when death occurs in the hospital. She may be involved in obtaining consent for an autopsy or notifying the coroner or medical examiner of a patient's death, however, she is not legally responsible for performing these functions. The attending physician may need information from the nurse to complete the death certificate, but he is responsible for issuing it. Question 49 before rigor mortis occurs, the nurse is responsible for a. Providing a complete bath and dressing change b. Placing one pillow under the body's head and shoulders c. Removing the body's clothing and wrapping the body in a shroud d. Allowing the body to relax normally Answer, B. The nurse must place a pillow under the decreased person's head and shoulders to prevent blood from settling in the face and discoloring it. She is required to bathe only soiled areas of the body since the mortician will wash the entire body. Before wrapping the body in a shroud, the nurse places a clean gown on the body and closes the eyes and mouth. Question 50. When a patient in the terminal stages of lung cancer begins to exhibit loss of consciousness, a major nursing priority is to A. Protect the patient from injury. B. Insert an airway. C. Elevate the head of the bed. D. Withdraw all pain medications. Answer, A. Ensuring the patient's safety is the most essential action at this time. 
The other nursing actions may be necessary but are not a major priority. Thanks for watching. Please comment, like and share.